Space. The Final Front Porch. These are the voyages of the Shark Tits Enterprise. Not, 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 not Shark Tits. Look, 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 we're in a ship. It goes around other planets, man. Come on, I'm being serious. Captain's Log. Hey, ever, ever uh, think that you're gonna uh, say one word and then another word pops out? There's a guy, there's a guy on there, he's not even from America, man. Ensign Peepers, what, what's that? Where'd that space blob come from? Uh, I don't know, just appeared, I guess. Lieutenant Goldbloop, fire the torpedoes. At your wish is my command. Captain, perhaps it would be more logical if we scan the space blob first. We have absolutely no idea what we're dealing with. Come on, man, fire! Firing the uh, torpedoes, yes, yes. <laughs> And that right there perfectly explains American foreign policy. What else do you need to know? Welcome back, beautiful and amazing human beings. This is Luke Radowski of WeAreChange.org. And holy cow, do we have some major moves by the huge decision just made by the FDA that is going to have huge ramifications on the larger narrative and agenda being played against everyone else. We're going to be talking about that plus a lot more along with a very special interview with the head of goldroyalty.com about some very prominent major problems in the financial industry, especially with some recent foul play by the U.S. Federal Reserve. But before we get into that, plus a lot more, the video that we played in the beginning of this broadcast is, of course, by Kyle Dunningham. And he does absolutely incredible work. I mean, top-notch comedic humor. Thank goodness YouTube can't detect and censor satire yet. And if you want to watch the full video of his multi-part series now, the link, of course, will be in our description. And uh, truly ridiculous, funny stuff that I think is definitely worth subscribing to. Now, when I said that clip perfectly exemplifies American foreign policy, I wasn't kidding, and I wasn't hyperbolic, especially with the latest news that we're getting of the Biden administration acknowledging that they took out a U.S. aid worker that was very prominent in the community, along with several children in a drone strike that they were previously toting as a major success against against the very dangerous boogeyman that were prominently named isis k now if you remember after this happened we on this independent media broadcast said that this extremely successful extraordinary strike should be questioned especially since the mainstream media was beating their chest about how huge of a success for the biden administration this was and even a few days ago we told you the official story of what happened here didn't make sense and now we're finally getting confirmation that these are the faces of children that were extinguished by a U.S. policy that literally creates more terrorism than it says it needs to fight. Now, the people responsible here at the Biden administration, the mainstream media that toted these lies without even questioning them. Again, we were questioning them. We're not that smart. But the people who were carrying water for this huge atrocity of injustice deserve to be held accountable as, of course, we got clear outright lies by this administration, including the president of the United States who knew what was happening and still decided to lie to the American people saying that he didn't know what happened here. Again, an atrocity was committed. Lives of innocent small children were lost. Several of them, seven of them. Is anyone even going to be held accountable here? Well, as of right now, it doesn't look like it. And that's an absolute disgrace and a recipe for disaster since more and more of these actions will be taking place. Again, according to official documents and estimates, 90% of drone strikes launched by the United States have been committed in error and have taken out the wrong people. It didn't take a genius to question this latest strike, but if the Biden administration is not creating atrocities against small children, it's also banning journalists here in the United States from flying their own toy drones as the FAA recently announced airspace over the U.S.-Mexican border highlighting the huge humanitarian cost, the huge wave of thousands of mostly Haitian migrants coming through the U.S. border, walking back and forth like it's not a problem. And with scenes like this unfolding on the southern border, what was the Biden administration's first call to action here? Well, we have to ban journalist 
toy drones from showing the American public what's happening here. Again, a lot of this is happening because of new policies by the Biden administration surrounding deportation flights to Haiti, which he said he ended, which created a huge onswell of Haitians coming to the U.S.-Mexican border. Biden has since then said that these flights have continued, but yet again, we have another humanitarian crisis unfolding with thousands of people living in squalor in horrible conditions, all because of this administration policies that continue to spread human suffering in one way or another. Now, when they're not busy droning children, stopping civilian drones from actually showing the travesty of injustice that they're causing, the administration is also very heavily pushing for very heavy-handed medical policies, all of course in the name of protecting your health. Yes, because the administration that unapologetically lies about taking out small children definitely is the same bureaucratic agency that should be in charge of my personal well-being. As of course, we reported to you within the last few weeks that the Biden administration has been pushing very heavily to implement a third procedure on top of the already two procedures that it mandates many Americans take. As of course, this quote, safe and effective procedure is not that effective within uh, a few weeks time. The FDA, a US regulatory body, was in charge of making the decision whether this third procedure was going to be implemented on the American people, implemented with the mandates, implemented with the domestic permission slip passport system that some American cities have implemented. And surprisingly, the FDA voted 16 to 2 against this third procedure and approving it for healthy people under the age of 65. Why? Well, that's because there's not enough evidence that it is safe and effective. And uh, wow, this is a major move here by the FDA that definitely sets back the, the narrative. The agenda that we have seen implemented in other draconian places like Israel and Australia. Israel, by the way, implemented the third procedure and now they're viewed as the sickness hotspot of the world with their cases surging in extremely high numbers from a population that has complied with this procedure more than almost any other in the world. Again, record high spikes of cases, hospitalizations, as Israel is the world leader in third procedures. This could be one reason why the FDA ruled against this third procedure, but predominantly, if you look at their decision, they said that there was not enough evidence that specifically backed this third procedure, and this left some people commenting that finally we are getting some common sense here when it comes to the FDA and their decisions. Now this vote is is major, not only because it sets back the narrative and the agenda, but, but also importantly, this is also on the heels of two top FDA officials recently resigning because they said the Biden administration was pushing for this third procedure too aggressively, saying that Biden insisted on implementing this before the agency even approved it. And because of this overzealous, aggressive push by this administration to try to implement third procedures on the American public, this is why two very important figures at the FDA recently publicly resigned. This was the lead individuals in charge of approving procedures that left in frustration because of the unscientific, politically driven policies by this administration, which this third procedure will be implemented into, of course, the domestic passport systems as announced by Australia, as planned by, of course, New York City, that as of right now is enforcing mandates that is discriminating against people for daring not to take this procedure or not being able to because of their doctor's advice. Since, you know, there, there's people who have allergies. There's people who have adverse reactions to some of the chemicals inside of this thing. There's some people with re religious exemptions, and there's some people that if they took it with their immune compromised system, they would be hurt or either die because of. But still, in New York City, even if your doctor tells you it's not safe to take this procedure, you are still banned from living life like a normal human being. This, of course, as hundreds of protesters have been hitting the streets in New York City, protesting a lot of this 
nonsense, and rightfully so, since it's leading to a lot of discriminatory negative consequences and denying people the right to live a normal life because of something that they cannot take. This was uh, one of the photos uh, from the protest highlighting Nicki Minaj as one of, of course, the symbolic representation of resistance against a lot of this madness. And uh, New York City is not known for its protests, so to see this many people come out in defiance of a lot of this lunacy is pretty incredible to see. But but also, getting asked your papers please everywhere you go is not pleasant. This as there have even been brawls and fights happening at restaurants with overzealous restaurant workers complying with government mandates and being intrusive into people's personal lifestyle choices. To the point where even Black Lives Matter officially is planning a protest in New York City after a fight broke out when a black woman was asked for her paperwork in order to have some food. Papers, please. And they're almost acting like the U.S. Federal Reserve with the obsession of paper, which they're massively printing and hyperinflating the U.S. economy by literally hitting the burr button and acting like out-of-control money-printing lunatics. As we're finding out that the Federal Reserve was buying up assets, businesses, failing bonds and stocks like crazy last year. As of course, they are implementing a policy that is called socialism for the rich and cutthroat capitalism for everyone else. As literally, the U.S. Federal Reserve goes out of its way to make sure that their Wall Street Big business, big bank buddies are protected. Their losses are covered by U.S. money printing and the U.S. Federal Reserve policy as they suck up all the losses and the super powerful, of course, get to keep all of their winnings. And now we're finding out that some of the Federal Reserve assets that they bought that they helped save from facing the true reality of the markets were assets that were owned by the current Fed chairman, Jerome Powell. Huh. So the Federal Reserve is bailing out and saving businesses that are owned by the head of the Federal Reserve. Yeah, that's not a problem. That There's nothing to see here at all, right? Yeah, that's that's absolutely ridiculous. And for how long can we have crony capitalism? Well, we're going to try to answer that question plus a lot more. And to do that, we are going to be sitting down and talking to David of goldroyalty.com. He's a pretty prominent entrepreneur. He has his ear on the ground to what's happening right now in this business world. And we want to talk to him for many reasons, but also it's important to note that we are officially working with goldroyalty.com. And this interview was conducted on behalf of them. And the reason we're doing this is not only because this supports us, but this also helps Gold Royalty, a company out there, as we get exclusive information about the U.S. economy from a perspective that, of course, is not on the U.S mainstream media. So David, thank you so much for joining us. And before even doing introductions, what do you make of what's happening right now? As of course, there's two viral videos happening with just incredible viewership. One, of course, is a family being kicked out of a restaurant because they don't have the proper paperwork. And the second video is a business owner talking about how she could no longer feed hundreds of college kids because of these discriminatory mandates. All of this is happening as we're hearing headline news that the economy is doing better than ever. The dollar is stronger than ever. David, fr from your economic expertise, what do you make of all of this happening right now? Well, look, I think the strong dollar is more of a relative thing in that uh, many of the other currencies in the world are competing to debase themselves uh, and print more money in order to preserve their export markets. So the dollar looks strong relative to that. Interest rates are uh, very, very low at historical lows, uh, both on a nominal and a real basis. In fact, on a real basis, they're negative and probably more pronounced um, in, in negative terms in developing world. So as a result, the US dollar looks strong relative to those other currencies. but. The U.S. and the Federal Reserve in particular are keeping interest rates lower for longer, effectively zero on a nominal basis and negative in real terms, given where inflation has gone. And, um, uh, you know, they're they're debasing their currencies as well in the U.S. You know, they're they're printing money with reckless abandon. Fee of currencies are being debased and fiscal uh, debt is has never been higher uh, on a absolute per capita basis. And the only way the U.S. Federal Reserve can manage that amount of debt in a fiscally responsible ways to debase it by debasing the fiat currency underlying that. 
Now, David, I want to talk about that plus a lot more, especially about your company. But before we begin, uh, for the people who don't know you, how would you introduce yourself and what can you tell us about goldroyalty.com? Sure. Well, I've been in the mining business for almost 32 years, um, principally as a mine developer and operator. In my career, I've helped to develop over 15 mines globally, both gold and, and uh, base metals. Um, and uh, I've operated countless more uh, than that. Um, most recently, before I took over uh, ownership and uh, CEO of uh, Gold Royalty, I was uh, the CEO of Gold Corp which was merged with Newmont back in 2019 in a $32 billion merger to create the world's biggest gold company. So now, now David, uh, before doing this interview, I, I, I saw this meme going around, and, and it's a picture of Tom Brady with the caption, buyer, I'll just wait until the market crashes. And then it's literally a picture from every season of Tom Brady's career. And that is the market explained there. Now, with the Biden administration simply just printing the presses all day long with the U.S. dollar, are you worried about a currency confidence crisis? Well, well, certainly. And I think, you know, gold is a barometer of that. We've seen gold appreciate significantly over the last several years to all time highs last year of over two thousand dollars an ounce. And I believe there's still quite a bit of runway for gold given the continued debasement of the currencies, uh, the continued low interest rates, the lower for longer. Um, you know, as Jerome Powell said, he's not looking to tighten up monetary policy anytime soon. I think we're going to continue to see a debasement of that currency and gold, gold reflects that. Even cryptocurrency to an extent reflects the angst that people feel, and particularly young investors feel about the debasement of their fear of currencies. They're looking at ways to safeguard their capital. I think with cryptocurrencies, that's, that can be a bit misguided, um, just because I think that uh, the central banks globally are going to horn in on the cryptocurrency market. They're going to create digital currencies of their own and effectively make uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies a fiat currency like every other uh, major paper currency. Gold is really the one true currency that can't be manipulated and printed uh, like every other fiat currency. Now, now, David, there's a lot of news about gold today. What's your reaction to it? Because, you know, historically, gold is a hedge against the dollar. Can you speak to that and the role of gold in today's world for governments and central banks? Well, I think gold is more than just a hedge against the U.S. dollar. It's a hedge against inflation generally and the debasement of your capital, your savings. Um, as, as money is being printed with reckless abandon, the value of your savings are going down. Inflation's eating away at that. Gold preserves that. Um, and, and there's really no opportunity cost to owning gold today. Given interest rates at these exceedingly low levels, you're not getting the interest on your savings anyways. And while gold doesn't yield anything, it certainly preserves uh, your capital in an environment where inflation eats away at your savings. Now, uh, how do you see this kind of moving forward with uh, this current market? How do you see the future of gold uh, in the markets? Well, look, I, I think gold is nowhere near its all-time high. I mean, I, I know we exceeded $2,000 an ounce last year, which nominally was the peak for gold. But if you look at back the last time we had a significant inflation cycle, which was back in the 1970s and early 80s, Gold at that time reached nominal highs of $850 an ounce, um, as you know, back in 1981. If you actually translated that into 2021 dollars, in other words, inflation adjusts that 850 peak, it actually would equate to about $3,000 an ounce. So we're far away from what I would consider a cyclical peak for gold, and I think we're entering the same sort of inflationary cycle that we had back in the 1970s. Now, back in the 70s, that was spurred on by the oil embargo and the in infection of the uh, inflation um, uh, of the supply chain that oil prices had uh, on the global economy. Now this is being driven by a coordinated effort by all the global central banks and the base currencies. They're just printing more money and that's hugely inflationary. We're starting to see the effects of that now in headline numbers north of five, six, seven percent. But those numbers are really quite deceiving because they exclude things like food and energy and shelter, all the things that we need to basically live, they they extract out of the basket to measure inflation. But everybody knows that housing prices have inflated at least 30% in the last year. Uh, we've seen energy prices go up almost the same amount. Um, and we've seen food prices increase dramatically, particularly uh, during this recent illness that we've seen um, in, in the economy. And so uh, we're seeing 
dramatic inflation and and gold uh, will re eventually reflect that and i do believe that we'll see gold north of three thousand dollars an ounce in this cycle yeah and there's also commodities natural resources wooden planks i mean you go to the grocery store there's there's no denying that that something is going on if you're looking for a house on the market right now there's no denying that there's something going on and that's why you know it, it's good to try to get information from alternative sources and i like your comparison to the 1970s because when you truly do a deep dive in the historical context there's a lot of correlation between the 1970s and what's happening right now, especially uh, in today's markets. And that's why some people say history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Bloomberg even had an article today that literally said the food prices today are some of the highest uh, comparatively in recorded human history. So, I mean, this is just an absolutely crazy time to be alive. Uh, as, as you know, uh, uh, being in the business, how do you kind of manage everything that's going on moving forward? What are some of your strategies and, and how are you going to be, uh, you know, making the economic moves from here on out? No, it's an excellent question. And, and if you buy into uh, our investment thesis on gold, if you believe it's going to go up to at least $3,000 an ounce, the question you have to, ask, have to ask yourself as an investor is how, how do I play the gold market uh, most efficiently? How do I maximize my return in that market? And everybody should have at least 10 to 20 percent of their portfolio in some sort of gold exposure to protect and preserve your, your savings and your capital. And there are a few ways to play it. You can obviously line up at the bank and buy physical gold, buy it in coins and bars. But of course, you have to undertake the expense of storing that and keep it, keeping it in a safe place. Uh, the other way is the, the buy the ETF, which trades on the New York Stock Exchange and is physically backed by gold. So it's like buying gold and you're getting the economy to scale within that pool of gold uh, in terms of your, your storage costs. It's, it's considerably more efficient uh, to own gold that way um, to, through the ETF. And then you can buy the gold mining equities. They provide you leverage at the gold price and leverage to their exploration success. If they grow their deposits geologically, that creates value and, and you get the lift from that. But of course, you're exposed to the underlying operating cost risk and capital cost risk because obviously those input costs are going to inflate in this, in this environment where the economy is experiencing significant general inflation. Um, the other way of playing gold and why I position myself at this point in my career in the royalty business is through royalty companies, gold royalty companies like Gold Royalty Corp. In that we get top line exposure. Um, we get a royalty on the revenues from gold mines and we're, uh, we get leverage to the expiration success. So our royalties are on the deposits. If the deposits grow geologically, then the value of our underlying royalties grow because the mine lives are extended and we get that upside. But what we're insulated from is operating and capital cost inflation risk because we don't have any exposure to the margin of the mine. We're taking a percentage of the top line. So if costs inflate, our shareholders are entirely, entirely insulated from that. That's why I think it's the best of all worlds. It's almost like owning an ETF, but with the expiration upside that comes uh, from those deposits as the operators drill them out and grow them geologically. Uh, I don't know if you could get into this, but but if you can, can you tell us your your business model? How are you guys operating, and pretty much how the sausage is made? Yeah. So the bottom line is, we provide capital to producers, mine developers, and we take a royalty back on their property in exchange. So we help them to build new mines, uh, to expand existing ones, and by taking a royalty back, that gives us double digit rates of return on the capital we give to them. Uh, and that royalty is for the life of the mine, uh, regardless of how long the mine life is. And if the deposits grow through their exploration efforts, we get a royalty on that exploration growth and that geological growth as well. So it be basically gives us um, perpetual uh, exposure uh, to the mine, uh, regardless of how long the mine life is and how, how big it grows geologically. So again, because we're taking just top line exposure, we're getting a percentage of the revenue, typically one to 3% of the revenue from the mine. We don't care what the operating cost uh, profile of the mine is. Um, as long as it's producing gold, we get our share of the revenue. And so if operating costs go up, capital costs go up, that doesn't really matter. In fact, I would argue that if costs are inflating, that's likely very bullish for gold. And so our royalties will go up as the gold price goes up. We have full leverage to the upside in the gold price and full leverage to the expiration success 
that the underlying operators enjoy and enjoy on those deposits. Now, uh, how has your strategy changed over time? What's next? Do you guys have any uh, exciting projects that you guys are uh, putting a lot of energy into? Well, you know, we only IPO'd back in March. We raised $90 million US. So a year ago, we were just a concept. Um, and we've gone from concept to raising $90 million US. And actually, we now have a portfolio of almost 200, uh, 200 royalties uh, uh, on mines across the Americas. And so we've created a significant amount uh, of diversity within our portfolio across the Americas on 200 separate gold mines and development projects. So we're well diversified. We've created scale very rapidly. Uh, we'll be approaching three quarters of a billion of U.S. market cap um, by the time we complete the most recent merger uh, that we announced back um, in, in early September, late August. And we're also pursuing a roll-up strategy. There's been this broad proliferation of royalty companies that have come into the market over the last couple of years, but many of them are zombies because they're too small, they can't raise capital, and they can't deploy capital as a result. But they have reasonably good portfolios, and so we've been buying up a number of these smaller players to create scale within our business. And scale is extremely important because the bigger we are, the easier it is for us to access capital in the equity markets that we can then deploy into new royalty opportunities to get double digit rates of return for our shareholders. Now, uh, if everything could go your way in the future, what would happen? What would be your major catalyst for things working out best for you guys? Well, look, um, we've acquired scale very, very quickly. We've grown very, very quickly. Um, and typically, royalty companies trade at two to three times the underlying value of their business because of their scale, because of their low risk profile. Again, they only have top line exposure. They don't have operating costs and capital cost risk. So as a result, they tend to have very high multiples relative to the gold producers. Uh, right now, we're by our, our own measure trading at close to one times the underlying value of our business. So that's immense upside, potentially one to 200% upside as we achieve that scale and get that re-rate in the marketplace. And that's what we're seeing as a prospect for our shareholders. And that's what that's why our IPO so, was so successful is because they saw the potential uh, of achieving that re-rate um, when we when we uh, launched our IPO. And as we've executed in our plan of rolling up our competitors, uh, that re-rating re is underway. Yeah, I'm on the website right now. I'm seeing a lot of data. I'm seeing a lot of graphs. You guys have a lot of information available to uh, the general public. I'm going to put the website, of course, down in the description below. David, uh, thank you so much for providing uh, your perspective, your viewpoints about what's happening here, especially in the global context, because there, there's there's so much disinformation. There, there's so much hype. There's so much just people pushing for one particular aspect. So it's good to get alternative information. Uh, is there anything else you want to say to our audience? Is there anything that you think we missed that we should also that you also want to tell everyone? Well, look, I think our ability to grow quickly has never been better, the, the potential for doing that, because the gold mining industry is significantly underinvested in exploration and development over the last half a dozen years. And as out of existential need, they're going to have to reinvest back into new mines and they're going to need access to capital. And what royalty companies do is provide them access to cheaper capital they can otherwise get themselves and we get royalty opportunities as a result of that. Uh, that's what's exciting about what we're doing right now, creating scale quickly through mergers and acquisitions, acquiring other smaller royalty companies so we can scale up, drive down our cash to capital, access more capital in the equity markets that we can deploy new royalty opportunities. So we're, we, we could never be in a better position than we are today, given the underinvestment in the mining sector and the need for them to access capital through gold royalty. And if people want to find out about you or Gold Royalty, what's the best way to, to find you or to get involved? Goldroyalty.com. Uh, that's our website. So very easy to remember. Um, it's, it's a very generic name. We're very fortunate to be able to, to secure that name and protect it. So we're Gold Royalty Corp. We're also G-Roy on the New York Stock Exchange, G-R-O-Y. So you can access more information uh, on us either through our website or through the facilities of the New York Stock Exchange. Well, David, thank you so much for your, your time and your ear on the ground information, especially in the business world, because who knows what to believe anymore? I mean, you got people 
trying to sell stuff when it's at record highs. I mean, there, there's a reason we need more honest and kind of real conversations about these topics to understand what's really happening in this business world. Because again, some of it, some, so, so much of it is, is so confusing. So I'm happy you were able to kind of uh, break it down and share your information. I found it very important. If you did as well, share this video with your friends and family members. Literally, it's the only thing keeping this video, this organization going is your ability to literally get this out there to the general public if you like this video click like if you disliked it click dislike i wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you guys this is why i love you guys stay tuned for more here on wearechange.org